All right, so good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Sarinsky. I'm Katie Adair. I'm Danielle Dunner. And I'm Dean Wozniak. And we're team two, or DKZ Design, working on the Sioux Hills dewatering project. So today we're gonna to go over our project background, the preliminary research we conducted prior to our design phase, the existing site conditions, our proposed design plan, the estimate and schedule for the project, and then our final recommendations and conclusions. So the project we've been working on this entire semester is the Sioux Hills Neighborhood Flooding Issue or Dewatering Project. It's located in Sioux Hills, which is about three miles northwest of Escanaba as the crow flies. And our project sponsor was the United States Army Corps of Engineers with their key contact being Gary Ray. So the problem that's happening here are people's basements are flooding. The groundwater table is rising due to an impermeable clay layer, roughly 30 feet below the pot grade. Above this clay layer is just sand that's allowing the water to build. The area is really, really flat, so everything's infiltrating the ground, the snow melt, the rain, and there's no, no drain tiles along the roads, around homes, the water has nowhere to go. So over time, it's just creeping up, coming in through sump pumps, coming through cracks of the basements, and just any way it can find a way to. Okay, so then just an overview of our specific task on the Sioux Hills project in comparison to other teams, we were mainly focused on water conveyance. So we were to design all of the pipes and select an administrator to pump for those pipelines, and then also size the detention basin and select a location for that detention basin to go. Preliminary research. So the first thing we did was dive into a couple different possible solutions that we could have for this problem. First thing we thought of was just installing drain tile everywhere, but after really looking into it, uh, it's going to be too difficult. The constructability of it is just not very feasible. We're going to have to tear up roads, tear up people's homes, go in the yards, just destruct a lot of private property, and we really, really want to avoid that. So the next thing we looked at was increasing surface runoff in some way, shape, or form, which again is really hard to do in a flat area. So the final solution we ended up deciding on is a pump dewatering system where we're going to run piping, pressurized piping along roadways and to our pump stations in order to minimize the smallest amount of impact on the community. These pump stations are also going to be pulling water from all over. So now when the ground does recharge with infiltration, it's going to recharge to a level below the nine to 10 feet that it's already at below basement levels. And it's not going to have an impact on people's homes. Um, so some alternate designs we looked at while making our, uh, our considerations. Um, the first design that we looked at was using a gravity fed system to go down to the southeast side of the neighborhood to those seasonal creeks there. Um, and mainly the reason we discarded this solution was because the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers report assumes discharge to Bickler Creek. And there probably is a good reason for that, although we're not aware of it. Um, another design we looked at was we further explored the uh, tile drain design um, and the least number of tile drains you could use would be four and spread 1300 feet apart ish, but that would be 20 feet below ground surface so that's quite a deep hole to dig and also um, the US Army Corps engineers report discarded this uh, design solution as well just because they said that it would be too disruptive to the neighborhood. Okay, so then to just cover some of the major NEPA impacts or any social, one of the first ones is that travel would likely be disrupted for the residents during the construction phase of this project. And also there could be some land changes such as grading or ditches to help with erosion and mitigating flooding. Although on a good note, there could be improved community happiness and unity by helping fix their flooding. And also we did not find any impacts to any protected groups or any bike or pedestrian paths. And then for the cultural impact, based on research, we did not find any historical or archaeological sites within the Sioux Hills area, and there are also no historical buildings or bridges in the neighborhood. And then lastly, for the global economic, due to the small scale nature of the project with only about 100 homes being impacted, we found that the global impacts were negligible. And then in terms of economics, the pump design would be more costly, and so likely they may need to use community taxes to help offset that. But on a good note, there would not need to be any homes or businesses relocated based on our design. And by fixing the flooding, it could help increase the property value in the neighborhood. Existing conditions. 
Using the NRCS Web Soil Survey, we were able to conduct a soil analysis of our area of interest. In this neighborhood, you can see that a large portion of the area consists of Calcasca sand, which is somewhat excessively drained. This means the water, all of that infiltration is just going right through that, getting trapped by the clay layer, and then it will infiltrate back into people's homes and their basements. The other areas of interest are all gray sand and rust common mucky loamy sand. Those are located near our discharge location at Bickler Creek. So here's a view of the topography of the area. This one on the right is transparent, so you can kind of see the neighborhood. So the neighborhood we're dealing with is right here. And as you can see on this darker one that has more contrast to it, it's flat. It's all the same elevation, roughly plus or minus one foot throughout the entire area. So we're dealing with a system that has to be pressurized unless we have a whole bunch of fall. And in order to create the fall for a gravity system, we're gonna be working below the existing water table which would just be a pain in the butt for any contract. And I guess you can work below it pretty easily with directionally flooring it, but we weren't able to obtain any utility records. The utility companies are not very friendly with us. So in order to avoid that, we just assume that we could have these uh, trenching for the most parts outside of the roads. All right, and then this is uh, existing floodplains in the Sudhills neighborhood. Um, so you can't really see, but the majority of the neighborhood is that white color. That means it's outside of 500 year floodplains. So basically we're not worried about that. Um, but there's a darker gray around the Bickler Creek up at the top. And that is an area um, where it could flood in 100, you know, for 100 year floods. Um, so it's something to keep in mind in terms of discharge and uh, making sure we don't impact any homes along the creek. Okay, so then for existing wetlands, this was found using the USGS National Map Viewer. And so it mainly appears to be dominant up around Bickler Creek, although we would recommend that wetland specialists actually go to the site and identify and also confirm the validity of this wetlands. So this here is a map of the property lines and land usage within the area. These two green boxes here are county land and public land. Everything else is outlined in red, it's just kind of hard to see from the screen, but everything else is private property. So for the large portions of our design, we wanted to direct everything up to these green blotches of land. That way we, the county can just sell it off or give it to whoever's gonna be managing it. And we don't have to use any people's private property because in this area, people don't like giving up their land for anybody for that matter. And here's some uh, preliminary permitting that we researched. Um, as far as we're aware, there's no township permitting, uh, but Delta County does require sediment erosion and control permits, as well as building permits. Um, and on the state slash national level, uh, the Joint Eagle slash USA's permit covers basically anywhere where construction meets the water. Um, so all those listed, all the, the different regulatory agency permits and sections are covered under that joint permit. There are a couple of known standards that we'll have to adhere to during our construction process as well. The state of Michigan has a PCB TMBL of 0.026 nanograms per liter. There is also a statewide TMBL for E. coli and mercury. At our location, the E. coli and mercury are not going to be an issue. However, we do not have any data regarding the uh, quality of the groundwater in the area, so we are not sure of the PCB content. We'll also be adhering to the uh, Michigan Plumbing Codes for anything we'll be doing underground, and we will be using MDOT approved best management practices for stormwater management in our discharge location. Design plans. So this is an overview of our design. This white area here shows the neighborhood that impacted a flooding home. And these black lines here are where our HDPE piping is going to be running. As you can see, it's all in the roadways, in the road right of ways, so they can be directionally bored pretty easily. Once the water is pumped out of our pump houses, which are located here, here, and down here, kind of hard to see on this map, they'll be then transported up to this detention pond, which is now located on county property and discharged back into Bickler Creek through BPMs, MDOT BPMs which are best management practices. Um, so more specifically, our design is going to be a pressurized system. Um, 
as Zach said, it's pretty flat in the neighborhood, but there is actually kind of a, an elevation increase as you go towards the northwest there. So that's an additional reason we need that. Um, the HDPE pipe network will be about 12,000 linear feet long. And then we are including booster pumps at, at every well site because um, in the, the other team that was designing the deep watering wells was doing um, their pump design at the same time that we were. So we couldn't really take into account the head of the dewatering wells because we weren't sure, you know, what pumps they were using yet. Um, and there's also going to be a detention pond. Uh, and then here's a plan view. Uh, a couple things I want to highlight. Um, so you see, I have boxes around the different sections of pipes. Uh, so those are how we broke down the head loss later on in the next couple slides. Um, but more importantly, about a thousand feet of this is going to be open trench. Um, so it's going to actually have to be excavated and there'll be a pit that causes, you know, dangers to people around. Um, but 11,000 feet of it is going to be trench licks, um, which is that machine board underground pipe. So it won't be disrupting the neighborhood. And there's five board pits for that. Oh, well, this is a pipe detail view um, of our three inch main water line, which runs through section one to section two. Uh, it's roughly 4,000 feet long, and as you can see, there's only about a tenth of a percent of slope in this water line. It's got to go up a little bit to get to our next pump station for our tie-in points, but it's going to be very, very flat. It's got a minimum of five feet below grade for the top of the pipe. That way we're below all the frost regulation, which are about 48 inches within the area, but the contractor is most likely going to be going deeper when they are uh, pouring this pipe. Right here, too, is where we'll be tying in with a T-bell or a T-joint, I should say, to our line from our pump station, too, as well. So here's our pipe network volumes broken down a little bit more. Our first section is going to be 3,500 feet. Second section is going to be 2,000 feet. And our third and final section, which is the four-inch pipe, is going to be roughly 6,600 feet. Total, we're going to have just about 12,000 linear feet of piping running through this neighborhood. All again in the road right away, with the exception of the pieces tying into the pump stations that are on some private property. So, calculating our head loss through the system, the majority of our head loss, if not almost all of it, came from our frictional head loss of 535 feet of frictional head loss. That's the head loss coming from the pipes itself due to the friction. Total head loss in the system was 550 feet, with a gravitational head loss of roughly eight feet, which is very small and a minor head loss, which is about 4.5 feet, which is basically negligible for this system. So we then use these energy head loss values to then come up with the size of pumps we need in order to ensure that we can get the water to our detention pond. So when we went to go size our pumps, as Dean said earlier, we're putting a booster pump at each uh, dewater, yeah, dewatering pump location. And we assume that those pumps are going to add no energy to the system and it will be pumping from zero head. So with that being said, we need two three-inch pumps and one four-inch pump. The three-inch pumps have each have a maximum head of 250 feet, and the four-inch pump has a maximum head of 310 feet. These graphs, again, are kind of hard to see looking up on this big screen, but their operating range roughly runs like this and this on each one. Our first pump, the watering pump, is going to have to pump 100 gallons per minute of water, the second 200, the third 300. Hence the reason we jumped up to a four inch line. But so our operating range isn't going to be running at full capacity. It's going to be down at this range here. So our pump should not have to work super hard. These are the pumps selections that we ended up going with. You can see our three inch pumps uh, will weigh 1,085 pounds with dimensions okay. of 46 by 20 by 35 inches. And then our four inch pump weighs 1,650 pounds with dimensions of 52 by 22 by 32. And then down on this chart below, you can see the maximum head and maximum flow rates. Our system is not going to be anywhere near our maximum flow rate for these pumps. And then the uh, weight and model number for each. Okay, so then on the left, the image is a close up of where the detention basin will approximately be located. It's kind of bordered in red, and it was selected because it is public land and also starts or appears to be on a slightly higher elevation and then it's lower towards the 
Okay, and then the detention basement, it was sized to be about 0.23 acres. And that was based on the 300 gallons per minute flow rate scaled up to be a 24 hour period. And then the depth was about eight feet and we set that to account for any potential sediment buildup during the year. And then also we looked into some best management practices. So having like fencing around the detention basement, especially due to the steeper slopes and then having some vegetative buffers surrounding the detention basement and also having an emergency spillway lead off from one side of the detention basin in case of an emergency or storm event. This is the detention basin we ended up designing. You can see the, the bottom and sides of it are going to be lined with bentonite. This is a natural clay liner, so it won't leach anything into the water and it's not toxic to the, the environment. It's also self-healing. Should it be punctured or ripped in any way upon contact with water, it will reseal itself and expand. The basin will be trapezoidal, as Daniel mentioned, eight feet deep and 91 feet long with a 41 side slope. You can also see our outlet pipe, uh, which will be a 12 inch diameter, leading out to a riprap spillway before it discharges to the creek. The spillway is an MDOT best management practice that is required before discharging into a body of water. Uh, and this, this outlet culvert will also have a backflow valve to prevent any backflow into the basin should there be a flood event that would uh, reach the basin. Estimate and schedule. Um, so the first thing I'm going to highlight under this cost estimate is um, the mobilization, uh, especially because it's a little higher than 10% of our total price, but that's actually because it's the mobilization for all three teams um, that are working on this project. Another large portion of our estimate comes from the construction of the detention basin, which is pulling from the clearing, embankment, excavating, erosion control, slope restoration, geotextile culvert and riprap sections of this schedule or estimate sorry and then we also account for contractor safety so we have one contractor go out to the site prior to construction to mark off each of the specific components that are involved with our projects so enforcement and the detention basin location and then our most expensive items are going to be the direction of boring over three and four inch flooded lines they're also our critical path items and they're going to have to be taken into account. The four inch line is a little more expensive, it takes a little bit more to pull it, and we got more than your feet of it. With this being said, our total uh, cost comes up to roughly $970,000 with a 15% overhead and profit and 5% contingency. Contingency is at 5% because we don't know what's underground. That's a long ways to go in an area that is pretty unknown for ground conditions. This is not the total cost for all the teams combined. This is just our portion of the project. All the teams combined it comes out to roughly $1.2 million. This is our preliminary schedule we were able to create. You can see some of our major items are um, where the longer blue bars are. So our detention, our detention pond and our construction of the lines will take some time. We have an estimated start time of March 20th, 2023 and a predicted end date of June 17th of the same year. Okay, so then for critical items, as shown on a few slides before, the board three inch and four inch water lines are the main critical path items due to just the length and also they're part of the main thing for the water conveyance to actually occur. And then our primary expense was found to be the direction of boring and all the mobilization involved with that process. And then as Zach mentioned, the total project cost of all three groups is about 1.2 million, roughly. All right, and then here are some recommendations and challenges. Um, so because the monocle model uh, used to create this design was continuously updated throughout the semester, um, that was a, a challenge that we had was uh, the, the flow rates we were getting were they were changing over time. So, you know, we had to kind of change the size of the system. Um, but also I would recommend to the client that they look at the size of the system based on the, the current mod flow model. Um, another challenge that we had was that we didn't have any water quality information. So we weren't really sure what treatment measures we needed to put into place. Um, so that's another thing we'd recommend be done is that ground, groundwater testing is done for that. <coughs> um, and that we were unable to really analyze uh, any flood, flooding impacts or impacts of additional water to Bickler Creek because we had no idea what the hydrology of Bickler Creek was. Um, we were unable to make a site uh, visit. So that's something we would also recommend be done. 
Um, and then, of course, flood plan and wetland specialists should be consulted where any construction is done um, to make sure we aren't disturbing anything in and after that water quality testing and the analysis of Big Wood Creek, if the testing shows that there's no contaminants and there's we don't need a detention pond for settlement, and how whole structure could possibly be used as long as there's no contaminants in the water from the underground. Lastly, thank you guys for coming here today. We appreciate it. Do you guys have any questions for us? Um, did you guys look into how that would affect Pickwood Creek, like the flow rate? Would that have any inundation <clears throat> effects, um, adding that extra flow into that or, or not? So, uh, yes, we did. It would only add a, a couple of cubic feet per second to the creek. Um, but our main issue was that there wasn't a lot of existing data on the creek. So we don't know what the like uh, original creek flow is to see if we're exceeding it or how much we're really adding to it. Um, and we did request a uh, hydraulic analysis be done, but we were turned down due to being students. So, <laughs> with what we're putting into the creek, is roughly 0.67 cubic feet per second. That's what we added to the creek. But the values that we have after consulting with our other groups are probably a little low at 300 gallons per minute when we be pumping. The amount of flow shows can be closer to 600 to 700 gallons per minute. So, that would maybe jump it up to the just above one cubic feet per second. But with more water, it's going to do nothing but we believe benefit the creek's wildlife and aquatic life and wetland areas, assuming there's no like turbidity or contaminants in the water. Sorry. Question. No, this is the last one for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Nice work on that.